Hi, welcome everyone to the first data seminar of uh, 2021. I'm um, very pleased to have uh, Ashesh um, to, uh, uh, here to talk about his project. Um, uh, Ashesh uh, did his bachelor's from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, where he worked primarily in optimization and computational geometry. He got his master's from the University of Texas El Paso from the computational science program where his research was focused on high performance computing. Since then, he has been a PhD student at Rice University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, where he works at the intersection of theoretical deep learning, dynamical systems, and turbulence modeling for broad applications in atmospheric dynamics. Um, Ashesh was also an intern at uh, NERSC. Uh, last summer, and uh, part of this work was done uh, during the internship. I'm very happy to have uh, Ashesh here to speak about this. Ashesh, thank you for joining, please. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mustafa. Um, I had a great time at NERSC, and we continue to work even after that. And uh, the later section of the talk is about the work that I did at NERSC, while the first section was something that I had been doing uh, in my PhD for a while, something that uh, probably you guys and some other folks working at the intersection of dynamical systems, you know, climate science, fluid dynamics, and deep learning are, are sort of uh, interested or you know, could be potentially interested. And this was done in collaboration once again with, with people at NERSC, Mustafa, Karthik, a lot of help from uh, you know, Jaideep and, and Mark, and then uh, with my advisor and uh, an undergrad student at our lab, Adam Subal. My advisor is Pedro Masanzaga. So broadly, I'll be talking about uh, deep learning approaches for modeling uh, multi-scale chaotic systems. So uh, our climate system is a multi-scale chaotic system and geophysical turbulence. So usually if it's a multi-scale chaotic system and there is no spatio-temporal scale separation in the system, then we can call it turbulence. I, I guess there, there are more definitions and less understanding of what turbulence is generally or how it comes about but uh, mostly I'll be talking about uh, standard turbulence models or, 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 or climate dynamics models which are turbulent in general and then developing theory for multi-scale chaos which is one component to almost all turbulence models. So the motivation for this talk is uh, weather and climate modeling and certain aspects of weather and climate modeling that are very uh, uh, difficult in general, for example, modeling uh, climate and weather extremes. So weather extremes, for example, high temperature events or storms or hurricanes. And our climate system is uh, a, a continuous spatio-temporal system and it's very chaotic and it has interaction of large scales and small scales and mesoscales that are once again continuous in both space and time. And the fact that there is no scale separation that you cannot identified that you know, this is particularly the large scale and this is particularly the small scale. So the fact that they interact with each other, which means that the small scales have an effect on the large scale evolution of large scale, uh, evolution of the large scale flow, uh, while the large scale also has an effect on the small scale evolutions. Uh, this is what makes modeling these systems so difficult. Uh, the other challenges to it is that it's very high dimensional and often, or most, more often than not, there are multiple physical processes uh, that are interacting with each other. So these are some of the challenges in, in, in weather and climate uh, modeling, uh, turbulence, the multi-scale nature of, this, of turbulence, high dimensional systems, and the fact that they're so chaotic, which means that a very small error in, in, your, in your initial condition can very quickly blow up and render your predictions uh, useless in, in, in a few time steps of prediction. So the first part of the talk uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make this distinction and I'll call X as the large scale variables. Whenever I talk about X, you, you should think about large scale circulation, for example. When I talk about Y, these are smaller or intermediate uh, small scale things, for example, you know, convection and, and, and Z are very poorly understand, uh, very poorly understood or very, uh, very small scale stuff, for example, gravity waves, things that really uh, current you know, tractable or productions level climate models can't handle. 
uh, and then we would look at a toy model and, and see whether we can develop for some theory for this and apply deep learning or, or leverage deep learning to build hybrid models that do well on systems that have these three scales. And more importantly, these three scales interacting with each other. Now, generally what happens in, in, in turbulent flow or, or in climate weather models is that you have these subgrid scale processes or inter intermediate small scale processes Y and you don't really have a resolution that can, uh, that can uh, solve the equations governing the processes of Y. So you, you don't have a resolution that can actually accurately resolve these small scale processes. So what people tend to do, and, and, and this is common to both the turbulence and, and, and the climate dynamics community, is that they do something called parameterization. That is the assume, since they cannot resolve Y, I cannot run climate models at a resolution that can resolve Y. They assume that Y is some function of these large scale variables X. So for example, the subgrid scale forcing in, in a turbulence model is assumed to be a function of, of the resolve of the mean flow variables. And, and this function is very ad hoc. It's, it's, it has a lot of literature, there's about a hundred years of literature uh, trying to develop better and better or accurate models for this. But it's physics based and it and it's primarily something that is developed to make sure that you know your 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 climate model or your turbulence model is uh, is a stable one. So generally these physics based parameterization have a diffusion component to it. And and that way you lose out on accuracy, but at the same time you make sure that your code or your LES simulations, which are large eddy simulations, which mean that we are only resolving the large eddies, they don't blow up. Now in, in the climate science literature and a little bit in the turbulence community as well from work by Andrew Maidana, but mostly in the climate science literature, we have seen in, re, in recent times an idea of super parameterization. So what is done here is that if you have, you have, you have a large scale flow, which are resolved on a coarse resolution grid, what people tend to do is that you take each of these grid points or grid cells in this case, and then you solve a high resolution equation for the subgrid scale processes inside each of these grid cells. Now this, is, this becomes really expensive, but here you don't actually have this assumption. You don't just assume that Y is a function of X, you actually solve the equations for Y, which you should ideally do. But instead of solving it across the grid, you take one, one grid cell and you solve the eddy equations or, or the small scale equations inside the grid cell at a higher resolution. But you don't solve the full equation, you solve some approximate version of it, something that's more tractable. So for example, if, if your large scale grid, grid cell is about hundred kilometers, then you solve the smaller equations or the small scale equations at a grid resolution of one to 10 kilometers. And this is called super parameterization. And it's, and it's much more accurate. For example, it can capture phenomena such as the Madden-Julian oscillation, something that's kind of hard to capture, but, but it, it comes at a, comp at a high computational cost. So ideally we would like to perform climate simulations with super parameterization instead of just parameterizations, but this comes at a cost. So the point of this work was, or the first part of the talk was to, was to do super parameterization in a computationally tractable fashion. And, 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 and of course, by computational tra tractable fashion, I mean, leveraging some ideas from data-driven methodologies, uh, so deep learning, and then trying to merge it or integrate it with traditional uh, numerical solvers. Now, before jumping into that, we have seen a whole lot of work in the last few years on the first part. So when, when people have done physics-based parameterization, they've just come up with models that, that, that do y equal to px. So they've come up with physics-based models for p, which which often they have some physical intuition, but are very inaccurate. What a whole lot of literature have focused on is we won't impose any structure on P. We won't assume that it's diffusion. We won't assume that it's some constant time diffusion so that we can uh, you know, take care of energy at small scales. Instead, we're gonna throw data at it. So we're gonna either run very high resolution simulations and train a neural network to give you P. So we don't have any structure on P. We let a neural network decide what P would be. Or you, or you train it on high resolution simulations and then, and you then do transfer learning on observations. So use a combination of high resolution simulations and observations and try to come up with 
a neural network based parameterization and it has worked really well and there's been a lot of literature that have looked at this for example uh, stephen rasp had a uh, had a very famous pnas paper that that uh, did physics based parameterization by training it on super parameterized simulation so a common super parameterized model is called sp cam that's basically the super parameterized version of cam5 that i know not, a lot of people have not actually used uh, uh, i know mustafa and kartik have used it uh, before uh, and then there have been work by yuval and 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 uh, and, and then some work by chris betherton at udap and there's been work by laura zana and tom barton on doing uh, parameterization for ocean eddies as well so both the atmospheric sciences and the ocean science, like ocean dynamics people have looked at physics based parameterization now um when we when we wanted to explore the idea of super parameterization it was obviously because we thought it has a certain advantage over just doing parameterization and i'll slowly get into that but this was mostly based on work that we did previously where we where we saw that odes and pdes can be directly integrated with rnn type architectures and this was sort of uh, uh before we realized that uh, you know, attention models can do far better than rnn type architectures but there are certain advantages to doing rnns for dynamical systems completely from theoretical considerations but the idea for super parameterization is pretty simple it, it's like this so you have a dynamical system which is multi scale in nature so you have the large scale x and the small scales y and let's just consider two scales for the time being so dx dt is some function of x y and a parameter p which i will talk about uh but let's say it's some parameter so for fluid dynamics this p could be reynolds number and for climate dynamics people this p could be for example uh radiative forcing or you know a, a a parameter that sort of controls the effect of climate change and then you have the small scales equation dy dt which is some other function of most importantly x and y remember in parameterization y is expressed as a function of x alone but in reality these equations are all coupled because turbulence is a coupled multi scale system so it has to be a function of both x and y and if we wanted to explicitly solve this system we should integrate both these equations at the necessary temporal uh, you know necessarily like right temporal scales which is delta tx which would be a larger number because we are solving the large scale terms and delta ty which would be a smaller number because we are solving the small scale terms now what we are going to do is pretty simple we will assume an initial condition in y and we are going to data drivenly integrate y at delta ty and after a certain point of certain point of time say 10 time steps we are going to couple the value of y into the large scale solver of x remember super parameterization does the same thing except for this capital n which is a neural network or some data driven model <coughs> uh super parameterization explicitly integrates this numerically uh so you can find uh, so this this paper is published so you can you can uh, see more details about this on on uh, online it 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 is got recently published in games but this is the general idea of super parameterization uh, super parameterization so to test out this idea we are going to look at a multi scale lorentz 96 system so this is a standard test bed to to transition to turbulence or transition to climate models you have uh, a large scale terms a large scale term x and this is a little different from the lorentz 96 that we uh, would generally think of when we think of weather and climate this is a multi scale system so you have the large scale variables x and there are eight grid points in x uh, and there's a forcing capital f this forcing is some sort of radiative forcing or you can think of it as an anthropogenic forcing this forcing determines how chaotic this system becomes and then you have an intermediate scale y it has 64 grid points remember these are representing small scale terms so it has to be resolved on a higher resolution grid so for each grid point in x you have eight grid points in y so in in total you have 64 grid points in y if you have eight grid points in x and then you have your ultra small scale terms which are like if you want to think about physical intuition this is similar to like gravity waves like just an example on the top of my head these are gravity waves super small scale stuff really can't resolve them until you have very high resolution models but these have 64 grid points for each grid point in x so a total of 512 grid points so this is a fairly high dimensional system it has three spatial scales and three temporal scales as well 
and there's a large scale forcing term f which is sort of like the parameter p that i talked about so this determines how chaotic the system is now let's look at the time evolution of a grid point of x y and z you can see that x is slow moving it has it it, it has the, the 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 temporal frequency of of this uh, of, of the x variable is smaller y is fast moving it is intermittent and z is smaller and even fast moving so x is larger in scale so it is slow moving and large in scale the amplitude is 20 to minus 20 y is an order of magnitude smaller z is even smaller okay and the system has uh, the system has been integrated numerically with a fourth order ranga kartha solver at you know, 200 delta t this is the lyapunov exponent of the system and this is related to the uh, decorrelation time of the system so it's it's a it's a fairly chaotic system it has three spatio temporal scales they are still separated in this example the, the the scales are separated in this example and turbulence models do not turbulence does not have scale separation and i'll get to that but it's a good starting point to test out new algorithms so uh, and, and 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 to just uh, uh, make sure our objective is clear we want to do something very simple we want to forecast the evolution of x so we train it on data up till here for example and after that we want to freely predict the evolution of x okay remember y and z are both coupled to x and they are all contributing to x but generally we are interested in forecasting the large scales the large scale variables in atmospheric dynamics so we're going to look at the evolution of x and we, whenever i show you metric on error or rmsc i'm actually looking at x uh, by keeping in mind that y and z both contribute to the evolution of x so in order to get our true data on which we will we're going to train our models we use direct numerical simulation this is where x y and z are integrated at a very small delta t and this delta t is dependent is, is a characteristic time scale that is dependent on z so the smallest spatial spatial scale has to be consistent with the delta t that i choose so this is a very small delta t and you integrate the whole thing this is the highest resolution simulation you can afford for example in this, uh, if uh, you can afford in this example and it has maximum cost so i've i've normalized the cost the cost of computing this so basically by cost i mean the number of equations that needs to be solved uh, in order to integrate it for 10 delta t so and i've normalized in such a way that dns becomes 1000 and everything is scaled with respect to that now a high resolution simulation would be something like this you basically ignore z because these are very small scale structures so it's a little inaccurate than dns less uh, less accurate than dns but you still integrate at a delta t that is characteristic of zt so this is still a very intractable simulation for all for most climate models but this is much more accurate than parameterization for example uh, and we're going to test like compare all these baselines to see where we stand so parameterized models are low resolution models hence lr and this is basically representative of all common classes of climate models that exist here the here x which is the large scale term is integrated at 10 delta t while uh, the the small scale processes are essentially um, parameterized with some function f the normalized cost is much lower and hence a tractable climate model while super parameterization would be somewhere where x is integrated at 10 delta t y is integrated at delta t and then coupled to the large scale solver every 10 delta t so it's not coupled at every delta t that would be too expensive it's coupled at every 10 delta t so this is more accurate than this and i'll show you how accurate they are uh, but it comes at a larger cost as well so it's about 100 times costlier than low resolution models in this example so this is the true data this is how accurate sp would be 1.5 mtu or you know, 2 mtu is actually a, a, a pretty good lead time prediction horizon this is how well it, uh, the the predictions look like this is a control plot of x and t or t on the x axis and and the the, the amplitude of the variables on the y axis and then if you if you look at this over a hundred different initial conditions and you look at prediction horizon so for example this is prediction horizon this is basically where the relative error is more than 30 percent if you look at prediction horizon this is where these models stand high resolution models are super accurate very costly super parameterized models are less accurate than hr but more accurate than low resolution parameterized models but they come at a huge cost as well 
So this is where they stand. None of this is data driven so far. These all numerical models have different resolutions. So data driven parameterization, which is a common class of, uh, you know, uh, it's a common sort of work that people have been doing where they replace that F by a neural network trained on high resolution data. But apart from that, it does the same principle. This is, this is what we will call DDP, data driven parameterization. This is like data driven subgrid scale model or turbulence models. They all belong to this class if they're data driven, if, if they're integrated data driven. So if, the, if this function is actually, evaluated, actually trained by a neural network instead of just assuming that it's some diffusive model. While data-driven superparameterization has the same principle as that of SP, except it's integrated data-drivenly. So you don't have to numerically integrate all 64 equations of Y. You use an RNN to do that, but then you couple it at 10 delta T. So this is where, and we'll call that DDSP. So this is where those models stand. If you look at one particular initial conditions, you have DDSP that predicts up till here about two, two and a half delta T. Low resolution parameterized models they are somewhere here, much smaller than DDSP, while DDP is maybe slightly better than low resolution models because you don't assume structure on that function, but rather let, let a neural network evaluate that structure. It's slightly better, but definitely not as good as DDSP. So when you again, predict, when you average this over 100 different initial conditions and look at prediction horizon, this is where our model stands. This is what we are proposing, DDSP is almost as good as SP. Remember, we, this is almost as good as SP, which is what we want, but is 100 times cheaper. That's because you're not actually integrating any equations. You're running a, a network, you're running a deep learning architecture at in, during inference, which is, mu which is much, uh, much more inexpensive. And, and this is where DDP stands. Now, given the amount of work that we had to go through to, to get DDSP implemented and stable for this coupled system, this seems like like very small advantage, a marginal improvement in performance for going through the amount of work that we did to, to get DDSP into the picture. This is still better than low resolution models and still marginally better than DDP, but only marginally. So, and, and here's the reason why. So when I showed you the first picture for X, Y, and Z, I showed you systems that we're in quasi equilibrium with each other. So the, the parameterization assumption that says that Y is equal to FX, that is the small scale terms can be represented explicitly as a function of the large scale terms. That assumption is valid when there is temporal scale separation between these spatial variables. So as you see here that the, 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 the spatial variables, their temporal scales are distinctly separated. This is much more intermittent in nature, while this is a slow moving variable. If such a scenario exists, then this assumption is quite justified. That's why DDP-like uh, methods work so well. But in real turbulence, you don't actually have this scale separation. If, if you see here, the temporal scales are actually coupled to each other. And this is a more realistic situation. And, and, and this is where the quasi-equilibrium assumption that Y equal to FX assumption is not satisfied. And in climate dynamics or in turbulence, this assumption is not satisfied. It belongs to this class of, of, of phenomena. So ideally, DDP would perform very poorly when you look at situations like these, where there is no temporal scale separation. So we'll call this case one and we'll call this case two and case two is the more realistic one. And as soon as we jump to the results of case two, we will see where DDSP has the advantage. So the red circles are case two, which is the non-equilibrium case. And this is where the difference between DDSP and DDP actually stands out. When you don't have spatial temporal scale separation as in all cases of, cases of turbulence models or, 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 or climate models, um, this, this approach of superparameterization really stands out. And we see the advantage of doing DDSP. Okay. So also feel free to stop me anytime to, to ask questions, especially if some of these words uh, are not something that you're familiar with. So the, uh, the other thing that, that, that we looked at uh, in this problem was generalization to new distributions. So we, we all know that deep learning architectures don't have any upper bound guarantees on generalization accuracy. And while you know, it may work for ML people really well because they're always looking at test and training data coming from the same distribution, for physical systems, this is super important. You want to train your system on a particular parameter. So for example, you want to train your system on a particular Reynolds number 
and then you want your model to generalize to other Reynolds number. I mean, otherwise there's really no point. It, you can't just go and train every time you have a change in Reynolds number or you have a change in forcing in the atmosphere. So it really needs to generalize. And really, uh, things don't generalize when it comes to machine learning models. It really doesn't generalize when you move away from the distribution. So technically, if you think of the distribution of X at F equal to 20 to be like this, uh, your system is not going to generalize at F equal to 24 when you have, uh, when the distribution is changed. If you take test data from here on a model trained from here, uh, you're, you're, uh, the, it'll be very likely that your models don't generalize. And, and for almost all applications for physical system, this is something that we need. Otherwise it's just not useful. So uh, the, 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 the idea that we wanted to explore here is what is an inexpensive way to make sure these models that we are training generalize easily. And to be very honest, deep learning people have sort of come up with it already. So let's just take an example to make sure that there is the absence of generalization. So this is trained and tested with the forcing of 20. Remember, the, as the forcing increases, the chaoticity of the system increases. So if we increase the forcing, the prediction horizons for all the models will go down because the system has become more chaotic. It's inherent limit of predictability has decreased. Okay, so model to model, it may differ a little bit, but they would all cons consistently go down. Now, if we train a model on F equal to 20 and then test it from data at F equal to 24, this is where the performance lies. Uh, I, I forgot to mention about DD, which is a fully data-driven model, which means there is no hybrid numerical machine learning stuff going on over here. You just take X and you train an RNN to predict X T plus 10 delta T. So that's a purely ML model. And that obviously does the worst amongst all of them because it has no information about the small scale dynamics that, that is forcing onto the large scale flow. <clears throat> so if you train the model on F equal to 20 and test it on F equal to 24, there is a gap in, in terms of performance. And this is basically the generalization gap. And this gap is way too high for a case where there is no spatiotemporal scale separation. When there is no equilibrium, the realistic case, this generalization gap is too high for any of these models to be useful. So what we did was, well, transfer learning, obviously. So uh, just to show you the extent of transfer learning that we can do for a system like this, and then, and you know, we have, Tested this on Lorenz 96 on 2D turbulence flow on you know, stochastic Burgers turbulence, and hierarchically complex partial differential equations. So this idea really works well. So you train on 1 million samples of f, f equal to 20, and and then you and you are training for for parameterized models the DDP model you train an ANN for the DDSP model you train an RNN. You 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 find the set of weights. You initialize your model for F equal to 24 with these set of weights and you take 1% of the data and you retrain the model. So 1% of the data, this can be done in online fashion. You don't actually have to stop your production, go and retrain the model. You can do it on the fly. Uh, and, and, and then you deploy this transfer learned uh, model. And as soon as you do that, as soon as you have transfer learning, you, you see that you get back the generalization accuracy. So just to ensure that this is really an artifact for transfer learning and not just a fluke, what we did was we, we started with a random set of weights as well and took 1% of the new training data from F equal to 24 and, and just see how well that does. This is where random initialization would lie. So you basically give you garbage prediction. So transfer learning is an advantage. It works across systems really well because we, we, we tried this for different ranges of increase in F, different systems as well, more realistic flows, and, and, and there's something that we came up. So, yeah. I have one question here. Have you sure. tried training a model on, on data sets with uh, both, uh, like with multiple F values? Yes. Because that's the realistic case that you would have in, in like an application, right? Right, yes. So, 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 so uh, yeah, so, so this is a great question uh, and, and let's put this question uh, much more in perspective. So what Mustafa is saying is that you have, you have data from F equal to 20 you, and then you said you retrained it with a little bit of F equal to 24. That's, that's what I said. And what Mustafa is saying that you have F equal to 20, F equal to 24, F equal to 28. Let's train them all together. Let, let's take data from all these three different 
probability distributions and then train a model with that. So from a dynamical systems perspective, this is called uh, come up with a phase space that is representative of all these three distributions or for transfer learning, what I'm doing is I have a phase space at f equal to 20 and then I'm extending or stretching the phase, phase space to f equal to 24. Uh, intuitively, I, I, I don't know which one should be better or not, but experimentally, I saw that if I do cascaded transfer learning, that is if I do f equal to 20, then retrain it on f equal to 24, then retrain it on f equal to 28, my performance is better than training on a pool of data together. Now, okay, yeah, this is the answer to my, experiment. this is what I found from experiments. Go on, Mustafa. With the same amount of data set when you with train the same all amount. of them? I see, yes. okay, okay, thank with, you. With, this, with the same amount of data set. Now, I don't know whether it's an artifact of the generalization error, or if there is something much more fundamental from a dynamic systems perspective that, that makes it do so. Um, not that I've uh, tried to come look at you know, explanations uh, as well, but experimentally, yes, this is what I obtained. I see. So it's likely once you have, once, if you use transfer learning to, for example, you fine tune it for F24, then uh, it will perform, you know. Correct. Bad on F20. So that, there is some forgetting there, right? That is true. That is yeah. true. Okay. Okay. So Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So this was pretty much the end of the DDSP sort of work that we did. You can find more results and more. And, and so and I'm looking at short term prediction horizon here. We've also looked at long term predictions such as the probability distribution for say, you know, a hundred year runs or, or very long runs, etc. And, and all of these uh, results hold up there as well. And you can find all of them in the paper. But this is where I'm going to end my DDSP, uh, the, the work on, on DDSP and quickly jump to the work that I was doing with NERSC. And uh, the, the work that I was doing with Mustafa and Karthik at NERSC was on <coughs> data-driven weather forecasting. So all of this that you saw were parameterization or super parameterization efforts where you have a numerical model working in conjunction with a data-driven model. At, at NERSC, I was doing work where with fully data-driven models. Of course, we were looking at more complex architectures, deeper architectures, something that you know, architectures that are more reasonable for forecasting. And we're looking, we were looking at data sets that were more complex as well. For example, the ERA-5 data set, which is actual observation data, not actual observation, these are reanalysis re data, but this is as close to actual observation as we could get. And we're not the first people who are doing data driven weather forecasting. A lot of people before us have done it. And the go-to architecture or go-to type of architecture has always been encoder decoders uh, or, or some sort of encoder decoder or UNET, for example. And ideally the way these problems are set up are not in the form of RNNs uh, because RNNs are inherent you know, stability issues with physical systems. The way they set up these problems is that they show you fields at time T this, this is, for example, the Z500, which is sort of uh, the geopotential at five kilometers from the Earth's surface. And they want to predict T plus delta T. And the training is set up exactly that way. They, they were, they're going to optimize over multiple examples of T and T plus delta T, lambda being the weights of this neural network, whatever architecture they choose. Now, some people have uh, predicted multiple time steps ahead, for example, T plus delta T and T plus six delta T, and they found better performance that way. But generally, this is how the whole thing is set up. And while and one thing, if you go back to the literature, this is, they've always used convolutional networks, like whatever it may be, whatever fancy architecture they've gone for, inherently these are convolutional. So that means they have convolutions, they're pooling layers and a cascade of convolutions and pooling layers. Uh, John Main, Dan Dura, Altshar and Missouri, and they've, they've, they've shown these across different data sets, like GFDL dry models at different resolutions. They've shown it on era five at different resolutions and they've always shown while they could get comparable performance. So a pretty good performance. You could never actually beat numerical weather forecasts, like not, not even close to numerical weather forecast and way behind operational forecasts. So as much as data and weather forecasting is super exciting, we are lagging behind uh, in terms of accuracy or, or performance. So one of the things that we wanted to address, and we are, we, we are not competing to build models that, that have incrementally better performance on this very standard test bench of, of, of observational data, 
what we are trying to do is incorporate some physical intuition in, into these architectures. Um, <clears throat> and, and this sort of came from a slightly previous work that we did with, uh, that I did during my PhD, that was on, on capsule based architectures. And the idea is as follows. Convolutional architectures are in translational invariance, right? So, so for example, if you give it an image of, of a boat upside down, by construction, you should not be able to say that it should not be able to say whether it's the boat or not. Whether it will be accurate to predict some of the inverted boats or not, that's a different question altogether. These are very expressive networks. If you train them from enough number of augmented samples, it can do anything. But by construction, they don't have any property that allows them to uh, predict, uh, like predict on, on features that are rotated or inverted. And this is super important in physical systems because uh, a high pressure region over a low pressure region, for example, in, in, in the atmosphere can lead to very different dynamics than a low pressure region over a high pressure region. So these two are different features. These two are distinctly different features. They should not have the same likelihood associated with it in terms of uh, predictions. But convolutional architectures don't have a way to, to explicitly differentiate them uh, by construction. Once again, they can differentiate them if they're trained on enough number of augmented samples. But by construction, there is nothing there that allows them to do that. Uh, and, and this was nicely shown in a Sabre et al. paper in 2017 in Europe, where they showed that capsule-based architectures have the sort of ability to do what combinates cannot. So uh, it's the go-to architecture for doing this should be capsules, which have a property called equivariance preserving. And that's what I'll talk about in, 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 the, in the next few minutes. So uh, this work was, um, the most of the work is about uh, this uh, paper that we are submitting and, and, and parts of a workshop paper that we presented at New Rips 2020 this year. And the idea is revolving around capturing rotational features, okay? So this is what I mean by capturing rotational features. If you have an input that is rotating, uh, your architecture should be by construct, should by construction be able to detect that rotation in feature space. And the reason why convolutional architectures cannot do that is because they have pooling layers. And pooling layers cannot capture the large distortions in feature space. So ideally what we wanted was have <coughs> uh, uh, an architecture that by construction or that is sort of embedded in it, the, the, the property that is embedded in it, which, is, which would allow it to capture rotational variances in the deeper features. And we wanted to in, in, incorporate this as a, at least a sub-differentiable module so that you can do back propagation on it. So the way we did that was with spatial uh, transformer networks, which are equivariance preserving in the latent space. So <clears throat> when we set up this uh, weather forecasting problem, we went to a unit, uh, which is a standard architecture that people would go to, and you, you show it Z500 at time t, and you want to predict Z500 at time t plus delta t. This is the sort of architecture you'd use. <clears throat> the only, uh, what, what, and we ensured that there is zonal periodicity enforced by doing you know, circular convolutions and whatnot. Uh, what, what, what we did here was we took the latent space and implemented a spatial transformer there. So we ensured that there's an affine transformation inside the latent space, which would give us a new set of coordinates from which we will sam sample the input again before sending it to the decoder. And this is a, this is a standard technique that people have used in, uh, in spatial transformer networks. By doing this, we make sure that this architecture, at least in the latent space, is equivariance preserving. And this may or may not help us, but for physical systems, this makes a whole lot of sense because we know that large scale vortices rotate in space and in time. And we want our architecture to be able to capture these rotations by construction. Now, whether they would lead to an improvement in performance is secondary, but this is something that is reasonable to have in your architecture. And this is what we call it equivariance preserving models. So we trained on uh, 12, so the, the results that I'm showing you here is where we are trained on 12 hourly Z500 patterns from the era 5 v analysis. Training was done on 1979, 2015. Validation between 2015 and 2017. And testing was done on data set from 2018. We have separated out the years so that there is no correlation uh, between the patterns. 
and we see the USTN, which is the equivalence preserving unit, <clears throat> at least for this specific example, does better than the uh, than unit architecture. 12 means it, uh, the, the, the patterns are sampled every 12 hours. And you could see things like Rossby wave breaking is captured better by the equivalence preserving architecture, which is probably an artifact of the, uh, artifact because of the spatial transformer network that is inside the lattice space. Now, if you were to look at 12 initial conditions, average over 12 initial conditions and then anomaly correlation, uh, this is what the prediction uh, horizon looks like. And you, you would see that the lower, uh, so, so, so uh, you would see that the, the lower this value, the worse the prediction is. So USTN is, to, uh, is blue. You'd see that you have one, one and a half day. So if you, if you cut a line at 0.6, which is the limit of predict, uh, prediction horizon, then you'd see that you have about one and a half day worth of extra prediction when you, when you draw a line through 0.6. So sure, there is some marginal advantage to doing spatial transformers and preserving equivalence. The other thing that we addressed here was adding data simulation to this whole, whole weather forecasting model. So how does that work? Well, data simulation is as follows. You have a model that forecasts and that keeps on forecasting from an initial condition. Because it's a chaotic system, you'd soon lose out your prediction because, it's, because the errors add up and you'd soon diverge from your, uh, you'd soon diverge from your trajectory. What you do is that you assimilate information every 24 hours or every 12 hours or every six hours, depending on when you have observations. And the, uh, so you get observations every 24 hours and you assimilate that information into your forecast model. Now, remember your observations are not perfect. They can be as bad as your model error or they can be better than your model error and you have no way to know a priori how they are. So the idea of data assimilation is to make sure you take the best of both worlds, that you take your forecast prediction and you take your noisy observations and you make sure that you assimilate these two information in such a way that at every, tw at, that at, uh, every 24 hours, that whenever you have an observation, you are able to update your state such that it's better than what you would have obtained from a model forecast and better than what you would have obtained if you had just replaced it with that noisy observation. So it's a way of reducing uncertainty in the updated state every time you have an observation. Now, forecast in general is done with a very expensive numerical model, but over here we have a data-driven model, which is our USTN model, and we are doing it every hour. So we have an hourly USTN trained that predicts ZT, ZT plus delta T, ZT plus two delta T, so on and so forth. At every 24th hour, it receives a noisy observation. It uses an ensemble Kalman filter to assimilate that information and give you an updated state. This updated state now acts as a reformed and new initial condition to your USTN as it moves forward in terms of prediction. These are some of the details of how the uh, ENKF is implemented. And if there are questions, I can go into the details of them. So you, uh, essentially what you do, you, get a, you evaluate a Kalman gain based on a large number of ensembles. And because you have a data-driven model, you can actually do a large number of ensembles. By large, I mean 4,000 ensembles, which is typically intractable with a numerical model where people do 50 ensembles at best. But because it's a data-driven model, I can do as much as I want because they're super inexpensive during inference. And then you use this Kalman gain, which you have identified from the ensembles, and you have an updated uh, state and acts as an initial condition as you move forward, further along in time. With, as you look at the results, this is with uh, smaller noise. The blue one is with smaller noise. The, the, the black one is with larger noise. This noise is in the observations. So every time you have a simulation, your correlation gets better, which means your performance improves because your initial condition has improved. So the state is updated because it receives new information and it acts as a new initial condition. And again, every 24 hours you have, you have improvement in performance. And, and how, how, how better you do is completely dependent on, on the, the level of noise that you have. So if you have more noise in your observations, you will always be lower than if you have less noise in your observations. Same holds true for a different matrix such as RMC. So to give you an intuition, if, you are at a, if your RMSC is 100, you have lost prediction completely. Anything between 20 and 40, you're doing reasonably well in terms of weather forecasting. 
Now, here's something interesting that you that 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 we found recently, and and initially we thought it was a bug, and I'm happy to say that we have tested this out on newer systems now that Mustafa, uh, pro, you probably don't know about. I got some new results today uh, on a different system, and and this really works out, and we call this a curious case of temporal sampling. So the idea is like this: if I train a model to predict every hour, I can plot my correlation with hours and RMSC with hours. I would get a graph. I can also train a model that predicts every six hours. I can also train a model that predicts every 12 hours. If you're a numerical analyst, you would think a model that predicts every hour, which is high resolution, should be better than a model that predicts every 12 hours. For a deep learning model, this, the relation is exactly opposite. A model that predicts every 12 hours is much better than a model that predicts every six hours. And, and, and hierarchically, as, a, as compared to a model that predicts every hour. So the blue line, as the worst performance, it's an hourly model. The black line is a 12 hourly model, it has the best performance. So the relationship is entirely uh, uh, inverted. And that's because this is an autoregressive model. Every time you call this model, you are incorporating generalization error. So you're adding error every time you call a deep learning model because it has a generalization error associated with it. The less number of times you call it, uh, the better performance you, you should expect. Um, Ashish? So, yeah. Uh, quick question. I know we've <laughs> talked about this before, yeah, but yeah, yeah, what yeah. happens if you go to 24 then? I mean, is there a point at which, you know, you yes. uh, get unstable? Yeah. Uh, not unstable. Uh, uh, the disadvantage will go away. Not unstable. Uh, but 20, for 24 hours, for example, this will do like slightly better than 12 hours. At 48 mm -hmm. hours, it will do worse. It'll do worse than 12 hours or worse than one hour? Uh, it'll do worse than six hours. And okay. we'll do something similar to one hour. Now, mm -hmm. this 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 value of forty eight is dependent on the system, and I would think it is dependent on the decorrelation time of the system. That's interesting. Thanks. Um, I guess it's another question on this one. Um, yeah. I, so the there's this really sharp drop at I don't know one one fifty yeah. or so. Um, I mean, what what's the how to understand the 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 transition between the one and six and, and where this drop off comes right so um, so there are certain artifacts here that I, I i i could not explain for example this this drop that you see is related to this weird plateauing in the rmsc as well so to be very honest i i don't have a very clear explanation as to where why this drop happens or what is contributing to this drop but to to to, to put things in perspective doing an analysis on this is sort of difficult because when you're calling a deep learning so when you're forecasting with the deep learning model you have multiple different errors associated with it. you have an error in your initial condition if you have a noisy initial condition and you have a generalization error and there's a third thing there's an error associated with the nonlinearity of the system so there's an error associated with the lyapunov exponent of the system because chaotic systems have nonlinear error transitions so there are three errors contributing to to uh, the final value of the error that you see at every time step. And all of them interact non-linearly. So there, none of them are linear with time. So it's sort of hard to analyze what is, which one is you know, causing which artifact in this curve. So to be very honest, I don't have a very good uh, answer to that. So for example, if I change this system to QG, I see a very linear line in terms of like, uh, in terms of uh, you know, drop in error. And Moreover, I see a very linear relationship between 1, 6, 12, like that. Uh, so if you cut off, say, for example, 0. 0.6, and you look at the prediction horizon, I see that uh, the prediction horizon is uh, uh, a linear function of the sampling time period, or the inverse of the sampling, the sampling frequency. But uh, I don't have a very good explanation as to what, which of these artifacts is associated with which of these errors. I want to point out that the three very non-linearly interacting error terms propagating every time you call this model. And one of these errors, the generalization error, we have absolutely no clue about. But we can, uh, so, sorry, I don't have a great answer to that question, but I guess it's worth discussing. If you, if you can take another question, David Skinner mm -hmm. has a question now. Sure. Uh, it's on my chat. Oh, uh, no, please. Sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. I had to find my, my mute button. Um, interesting. I, I, 
I meant to ask earlier as you were transitioning between the, yeah. the, the earlier models and these, um, do, you, do you expect to, um, to conserve uh, energy? Are there conserved quantities in these models? Or is that um, mm, Okay, okay. okay. That's, a, mm, that's an interesting question. By construction, no. At okay. the same time, this model is predicting, it, it's just taking Z and predicting Z, okay? So if you're talking about kinetic energy, so sure, you can take the derivative of Z and that would, although that is not explicitly velocity because it's your potential, but it's somehow related to velocity. And then you can think of deriving the kinetic energy uh, from there. But for real data, thinking about conserving energy is very difficult. But for toy systems, you're right. You could, you could sort of do a hand calculation from your predicted variable or, or do a numerical calculation from your predicted variable and see whether you're conserving energy or not. And by construction, no, I'm not. I'm not conserving energy by construction. Whether it's ultimately conserving it or not, I don't know. For the QG system, yes, it does conserve energy. Uh, but for a different system, I wouldn't know because it's not there by construction. By construction, there's only equivariance. That means I'm tracking rotational features, but nothing else by construction. And I don't have an augmented loss function where I put in an energy penalty term or something. Okay, because if, if the you know underlying physics does have uh, constants of motion, then you could apply the same equivariance trick to the uh, to the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So since there are great questions, I could just. I'll quickly go through this and we can take other questions. So basically I use this observation, this thing that 12 hourly model is more accurate than an hourly model and use them as virtual observations. And I do data assimilation every 12 hours as well. Remember, this is not real data. This is model forecasts, which are more accurate than this model forecast, which is an hourly model. So I use this as virtual observation and update the state every 12 hours. I could have done this at every six hours as well. And this could be, and this could really become a very sophisticated sort of forecasting pipeline, but this is just what I tested. And then I do again ob observation assimilation every 24 hours. And when you do that, you see that every 12 hours is a jump in performance. And there's a slightly less jump in performance every 24 hours. And this sort of dies down as with time, even your 12 hourly model loses out its accuracy at which point of time virtual observations is not uh, useful anymore. But you can use this trick to actually make sure, like bump up your performance every few hours. If you have models that are consistently better performant, if you are sampling at coarser time periods. So this is generally the idea of doing ML and DA with virtual observation. So the goal of this project was to do weather forecasting, the way weather forecasting should be done. That is not free forecasting, but with data assimilation. And then use these deep learning tricks or these weird temporal sampling ideas or observations that we had and integrate them in this data simulation framework with machine learning. Make sure we have a good or you know, potentially say optimistic uh, forecasting pipeline that is fully data driven. Okay, so there's no numerical model working here and correlations are above 0.9. So this is by no means way behind numerical weather forecasts either. So, this is sort of promising and we are looking more into this. And I think that's it, thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions or, or go through some of the previous slides if, if you have, want, if you want. Thank you so much, Ashesh, for this view of the many projects and very interesting results. Um, for everyone, if you have more questions, please go ahead. I just have one quick question. Sorry. I, <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe it's the obvious question which you didn't touch on was just whether um, the, the prediction is at the level at which it's um, compelling now with all this or. Um, so, so this, yeah. So I, I did not explicitly co compare with numerical weather forecasts in this problem. And the reason was, uh, it, as you'd see, I took uh, an error data set that was low resolution in, in, in general. So there's a 64 by 32 
uh, this is about five and a half degrees, 5.6 to 5 degrees, while the, high, the, you know, the numerical weather forecasts are at the high resolution. So um, that's why I couldn't compare with NWP forecasts. But uh, if you simply interpolate uh, the high resolution forecast onto this grid, then we are at uh, comparable accuracy. Of course, these are not free predictions. Uh, the operational forecast is, simple, is similar to this, but these are not uh, free forecasts. They have data simulation associated with them. But if the correlation is right. around 0.1 or 0.9, then we are doing pretty well. Right. That is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Pretty exciting stuff. Let me ask you a speculation question because I always like your opinions, Ashesh, on this. So, um, um, we know that like if we if we you know train bigger and bigger models and uh, uh, and all of that we can start reducing the, the forecasting error further right and then right. should be some as you started with there is some some a lot of features for these chaotic systems that are unpredictable right. by by their intrinsically unpredictable right R right you think that the the irreducible error should be the same error that you would get from a full um, um uh, physics simulator or there should like uh, it would be something much higher than that I, I think probably not for the era 5 data but for something like the 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 Lorentz systems that you are looking at do you the the uh, would the error there be the same that you would get from uh I don't know. I, I think probably the physics simulator is not the right one but like it's it's the there should be some irreducible error right Right, and the, is, and I think yeah. the irreducible error should be the same. Even if you have if you have the best physics simulator, and you have the best deep learning emulator, I think the irreducible error that is coming from the intrinsic property of the chaotic system, that is the irreducibility of the error coming from the Lyapunov exponent because of error propagation through the Lyapunov exponent, they should be the same. If you have the best deep learning emulator out there, but the generalization error for the deep learning emulator that's something that we don't have a control over or you know even an any even a weak bound over we don't have a big o bound or a big omega bound any sort of bound over that error so i think that is what makes a numerical model stand out in comparison to a deep learning model if you can control that error i think we are at the same the, the, the playground is level that way i see and um so how far are the current models? Is there a way actually to measure this irreducible error for um, uh, real, like reanalysis data, for example, or you just have to empirically measure it? Uh, it's, I guess Jaydeep would be best to answer this question, but for real data, it is still empirical. For systems where you can actually go and calculate the Jacobians and so on, you could still have a pretty good estimate of how this error propagates through the Lyapunov exponent. But for error five, the model is so complicated. The underlying model is so complicated with the data assimilation and everything. Uh, I think it's a very empirical calculation. You don't even have a good estimate of the Lyapunov exponent for this. So it's still pretty empirical for real data. But for toy models, you can have a pretty good estimate of how this error will propagate this time. Okay, thank you. Anyone has other questions for Ashesh? Um, real quick, I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, how you're calculating the uh, Lyapunov exponent. Is it just from the uh, the x variables? Uh, you can so uh, two problems for the for the Lorenz ninety six system. You can actually go and calculate the Lyapunov exponent of x y z separately by you know calculating the Jacobians and all. So that is a very good estimate, the value that I gave you 4.5 for the X variable alone. That is a very good estimate. For error five, I never reported Lyapunov exponent because one is I only have access to Z and there is no point calculating Lyapunov exponent with Z. But calculating Lyapunov exponent from data is much more finicky than any machine learning model out there. So uh, there's, there's really no point in calculating Lyapunov exponent from any of the variables in error five using just data alone. But yeah. for the Lorentz system, it's a very robust value that I showed you for 4.5. That's from the equations, not from data. Um, sorry, I know we're going over time, but just like a quick question is that, you know, uh, 
there is some subtlety to like you know when you have these multi scale models i mean like what's the uh, right lyapunov exponent uh, right. to sort of report which 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 actually like is meaningful in terms of the error propagation right uh and so do you ever like do you try to like make sense of that because you know if the, the, if you try to look at the fast scale the upper of exponent then it will give you like uh yeah so i mean it's it's just a, it's, it's not exactly clear how those three upper of exponents that you calculate the fast scale one slow scale and whatever medium scale ones right which of these is like important when you think about error propagation so do you have any thoughts on that so because i am looking at the large scale flow uh you're absolutely right the the fast scale lyapunov exponents would also contribute to that error uh but because i was looking at just the large scale flow i calculated the lyapunov exponent using uh using the equations from just x now given that there is an expression of y in the x equations as well so when you're finally calculating jacobian that effect would come in but i did not quite combine the three exponents as such but i calculated the exponent just from x but there is a term involving y in that equation so that part is accounted for so it's not the best measure of lyapunov exponent but it is sort of the measure that people uh, generally use so this thorns et al paper at royal met society 2017 that's pretty much how they calculated the lyapunov exponent as well and they showed it in they had a, a, a lot more analysis in terms of error propagation so i was under the impression that uh, this value is to some extent accepted by people in the dynamic systems community thanks okay uh we have gone over time uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh for joining uh, ashesh thank you again so much for for the great talk i actually learned a lot uh, about what you have been doing and uh, lead up to the project that we worked on together so thanks thanks a lot um, thank you for having thanks, me thanks ashesh Yeah, it's great. Thanks. Yeah. I learned a lot too. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Ashish. Thank you.